gathering place. It's our corner, our palace, our parliament, our mecca, our sacred place where we gather to talk politics, sports, and yeah, even race, especially race. It's about business, it's right? about money yeah, management, to how to not do this, how to not get your credit dollars. messed up. Right. That's going to change a whole cyber, that's going to change you a whole money, dynamic of a culture. You invest it into the, into the investment See? group, then you, you, you it's something so small. See? You buy one house, you collect right. that money, next year you buy another house. And so forth and so on. But like, the problem is we don't have no mentor. People are not mentoring each other. Honestly, Honestly. two or three hundred years of being told that you're not even a person, maybe you're two-thirds of a person, and then you're told that, well, you're no good because the tables are set against you. It's not a level playing field. It's never been a level playing field, and that's stupid too. Anyone who believes that the only way I can feel good is to put somebody below me, that diminishes all of us, but they just don't know that yet. I'll be so glad when, uh, when, when the sun go down. When the sun go down. I'll be so glad when, uh, when, when the sun go down. When the sun go down. I ain't all that's leaving, but uh -huh. I want to lie down. But I want to lie down. I ain't all that's leaving, but uh -huh. I want to lie down. But I want to lie down. The matter, baby. Uh -huh. Yeah, I can't see. Well, I can't see. Oh, what got the matter, baby? Uh -huh. Yeah, I can't see. Well, I can't see. No deciding that the driver's boat. Uh -huh. yeah, it was down on me. Roll down on me. No deciding that the driver's boat. Uh -huh. yeah, it was down on me. Well, down on Chop your corner line. Uh -huh. I got chop mine. Well, I got chop mine. Just chop your corner like. Uh -huh. Like I got chop mine. Like I got chop mine. Well, you won't be worried when. Uh -huh. When the sun go down. When the sun go down. You'll never be worried when. Uh -huh. When the sun go down. When the sun go down. Uh -huh. of this film began in 2014 when an online documentary called The Whiteness Project was released. The Whiteness Project is a multimedia documentary described as an investigation of how Americans identify with being white. 21 Caucasians from Buffalo, New York, talk very candidly about their race. The result is provocative and sometimes just a little uncomfortable. What does your whiteness mean to you? Uh, you know, what does it mean to be white in our country? There's probably a little guilt there. There's been things that white people or our race has done that maybe we're not proud of. It's my honest opinion that today the white race is the one that's discriminated against. There should be more white people speaking up and talking about white people. But as I watched it, I realized it was very important, uh, being that I couldn't hear these conversations in a casual setting. Uh, so to really open up dialogue, I decided to make the Blackness Project uh, not to be combative or have something versus, but to really open up the dialogue on race and get both perspectives uh, with our history in America. Chapter one, watching the Whiteness Project. I saw, uh, uh, excerpts from it and, and some of the statements and pictures and the people of the Whiteness Project and some of the things that they said. And I thought, uh, they, that person has to have his or her say. They really do have to have that say because they feel like they're pressured and they're, they feel like they're uh, 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 disenfranchised. And, and they got to have their say. They can't have their way. Everybody can't have their way. But they can have their say. 
and and one of the one of the contracts with America that Americans have is I got to be willing to let uh, in order for me to have my rights, I got to be willing to let somebody else have their rights. Having watched The Whiteness Project, I felt frustration. I felt frustration because it's a clear indication that we are still having the exact same conversation we were having when I was a child. And because I'm 64 years old, that can be quite disconcerting, uh, disappointing, frustrating. I had hoped we would have advanced in the conversation beyond that point by now. The whiteness project for me was a bunch of ignorance. It was basically people talking about things that they really, they really had no real knowledge about. If they were trying to be sincere, I commend them. Um, but I believe that they're shunned from from not the reality because it's their reality you can't judge someone for the world that they live in what we're having now with the whiteness project in this this is a good forum so regardless of what brought us here we need to be here we need to start having these conversations to kind of make ourselves you know more comfortable understanding um the different dynamics of people not just black white you know whatever it might be but just we're people we're people first. It made me feel weird, personally. I, I felt weird. I just felt weird. Because I, I guess those are things that aren't discussed openly. And, and at least they are. If they are, they aren't discussed around me. If we're going to talk about black men in general, very beautiful people. So when you smile and you say hello, that's not an invitation to follow me, come to my door. You know, I have a convertible to pull up next to me. I, I don't, you know, I'm just being friendly. I would smile to a woman or a kid or a dog in the car, any person. Uh, they take that as a opening to approach. And as I said, as a voluptuous woman, I don't, uh, I, I seem to, <laughs> they seem to gravitate that way to me. And it's just not comfortable. So do I call it prejudice that I don't like that? I guess it is in a way. I don't like that. I, it's, I, it's, it, I'm afraid. You know, so. Just hearing perspectives from that, from that angle and standpoint was just, it just, it made me feel awkward, like to, to even think that people thought like that. But I don't want to devalue anyone's opinion. I was happy it was made because it it gave me a, a insight into that perspective. Like I, I wouldn't have been able to to get that angle or that that insight if it wasn't for it being made. And I I think it really did spark a good conversation about race and culture and blackness and whiteness. Yes, I enjoyed it um, just because it was the first time that I had seen Caucasian people so uncensored. So. It was nice to be able to get that view because it's a it's a it's a <clears throat> view that I try to get out of my peers. Like in I'm in college and I'm in a dance program, which is an amazing dance program, but it's primarily Caucasian people. And when topics of race and like racism in the past and in dance history comes up, I find that a lot of people totally just go into this. They just go into their shell and they become afraid to engage in conversations and. Um, so it was just kind of refreshing to see those opinions. So I felt about the, the, the whiteness project that, uh, that th there was a place for it. What I, what I was, the reason I responded to this project and wanted to be a part of it, because I thought that there was a part of this that could facilitate a healing for any dissension that that project had. Shouldn't we be trying to get away from identifying ourselves by the color of our skin? Um, I, I think that that's, that's actually one thing that I'm actually going right after. I mean, should that be a defining characteristic? 
it is a defining characteristic, and that's just the reality of it. And mm -hmm. I think that white people would like to think that it's not a defining characteristic. And I think for years we've sort of been ha been allowed to sort of say, well, our whiteness is sort of a passive passive part of our lives, as instead of an active component of our lives. And I would argue impacts every interaction of every moment of every day. Mm -hmm. What's the reaction you've got? It's like six blind men describing an elephant. Each person gets a part of that story right. But somehow, that elusive larger story, whatever it is, just seems to slip away. It's part of a narrative that we're still writing about who we are and how to identify ourselves. Chapter 2. What is your ethnicity? Well, I'm African American. Um... I uh, was born in 1949, uh, and I was probably born colored. And when I went to school, in elementary school, I was probably a Negro. And by the time I got to high school, I was an Afro-American. And then by the time I got to college, I was a black American. And then by the time I got through all that school stuff and all them labels and listening to all that stuff, I uh, understood I was an African American because of my ancestry. My ancestry is African. Black man. Sounds more, you know, real. African American. I mean, I ain't never been to Africa. I ain't been in none of them. So I know I'm here in America, and I do believe that this is ours just like as anybody else because I believe we did more to build over here than anybody else. So I believe that America is mine, but I don't feel connected to it. I don't feel like this is part of mine. Today, you know, the languages or what's, you know, the way we would like to be called um, uh, to describe us is African-American female. Are you well, comfortable with African-American? Well, absolutely. You know, I'm a historian of ancient Africa. I understand where we came from. I understood what the challenges, and I continue to understand what the challenges were. And, um, and I understand the literature of who didn't want to, why we didn't want to be called Negro or why, which is what we were, which is fine. The second somebody start even calling me or addressing me as black or Negro or African American or colored, like I said, I got a nationality. You know what I'm saying? So the first thing is that you denationalize me, you dehumanize me when you call me black or African. Like, it's not a people, that's a place, it's a designation, it's an adjective. Uh, that's the one thing that, you know, first off, that's like saying, hey, Joe, my name's not Joe, my name is Greg. I am black and I am African American and very proud to be so. Despite the ambiguity of being African American, because since Africa is not a country, um, I would much rather be like Ghanaian American, but I don't, I don't have that privilege. Uh, the director of the film, Corey Green, uh, blindly contacted Ancestry.com, just telling them about the film, the project, and they responded. When you talk about diversity, the more diverse we are, you know, ethnically or culturally, the more the same we become. Mm -hmm. Because if we all are more diverse, we actually have more in common. So the more similar we become, which means the more accepting we become mm -hmm. of diversity in general. And, and the irony, especially for people who, who want to be, quote, purebred, yeah. that's also called inbred. And, <laughs> and speaking from an from, um, uh, um, evolutionary standpoint, the gene pool, the more diverse the gene pool is, the healthier we are. Yeah. Well, you know, what's really funny is if you started asking people probably 50, maybe even 30 years ago, you know, what are you? People would be proud of, mm -hmm. of being one thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I'm... You know, this one culture. What's funny now is when people take the DNA test and they look, and they're only one culture, which is really rare, they're bummed. <laughs> like, they're mad. They are, like, actually mad that, that they're not more diverse. I think it's exciting because I think we all, like I said, like, we all have this curiosity of who we are and where we came from. And finally, we, the technology and the science has advanced enough to bring that for us in a DNA test. African-American family history is something um, that I personally have done a lot of and that I find very rewarding and um, that I, I think is extremely important. But when we talk about African-Americans before emancipation, 
it's not available because it was never created. Mm. And that's heavy. Mm. And it's, it's difficult to say, you know, in a society that didn't feel the need to create those records to begin with, the best way to answer that is by saying, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find it. And I'm going to take those stories back out of obscurity and remember them. Black, white, Native American, African American, you know, what are you? And it puts things in perspective. Uh, and when I got my results, I was really blown away. Can you read those to me, please? 68% African. Uh-huh. It's a little bit more below, than, uh, below average than some. But now we can get into the specifics of where in Africa, what regions your family has lived in the last 500 to 1,000 years ago. So we have Cameroon and Congo, 23%. Benin and Togo, 20%. Senegal, 10%. Ivory Coast and Ghana, 8%. And then you can also see there's four additional regions in Africa. So those are your four primary. I'm, I'm not Pollyannish, but really, we know that race is a, is a social construct. There is no such thing as race. We are all one race, and, and the ways in which we have been identified and separated over the years has been a way of, of um, further uh, separating us, further creating these boundaries, these artificial boundaries that um, define one as black, define one as white, etc. Um, race really has been a construct that has been manufactured, and we don't talk about that. This is part of the issue of not talking about race, is not understanding where the concept of race comes from and how it's been manipulated and how we've been manipulated to buy into it and to accept it as really being a valid way in which to identify ourselves. Chapter 3, Slavery that during slavery, the same slave master who owned us uh, put his last name on us to denote that we were his property. So that when you see a Negro today who's named Johnson, if you go back in his history, you'll find that he was once his grandfather or one of his forefathers was owned by a white man who was named Johnson. His name is Bunch. His, his grandfather was owned by a I white get man the point. that was uh, named Bunch. Would you mind telling me what your father's last name was? My father didn't know his last name. My father got his last name from his grandfather, and his grandfather got it from his grandfather, who got it from the slave master. The real names of our people were destroyed well, during was slavery. Any, was there any line? When you understand the history of enslavement in this country, the only reason we got over here was because Euro-Americans and Native Americans couldn't, disease, couldn't deal with the diseases that came up in planting and in harvesting in the South. The South was a lot of swamp land, they had malaria, they had all kinds of diseases. And all of a sudden they found that due to our nature, due to the country we come from and everything, oh, these black folks can work these fields and they don't die off because we forget white folks had indentured servants. We forget that there was a feudal system in Europe where they were basically enslaved, they was held by land. That's why slavery don't make me so crazy because we weren't the only people enslaved. When we think about slavery, we typically think only about the labor force itself. We don't think about the industry. Slavery was about the cotton industry and the slaves were the only labor force that had a capacity to produce this cotton. Cotton industry and cotton was the engine that drove the US and world economy. The world as we know it could not have existed without cotton. The cotton industry is a multiplier that spawned off into all other types of industries. In the textile industry, the production of machines, uh, the, the, the development of the clothes that were sold, uh, uh, the shipping industry, the insurance industry, all of those things were related to cotton. It was big business. Slavery lasted for 245 years. 245 years. 
How could something so evil, so bad, last so long? That's the question. Because it produced profits. They think that we're just supposed to forget about slavery and we're supposed to forget about all of the wrongdoings that happened throughout history. I mean, I do understand, you know, it's a different world, but it's still kind of the same. We had a choice as a nation. When slavery ended, this country could have made the decision, do you stand with the patriots or the traitors? Black people, over 40,000 died in that war. 21, the Congressional Medal of Honor. We were the patriots. The Confederates were the, were the traitors. At that critical juncture in history, this nation made the decision to stand with the traitors, the murderers, the people who embarked on the bloodiest war in the nation's history. And they had no remorse. See? Remorse is a powerful word. It means that I'm sorry. I did something wrong. I, I, I need to be forgiven. I messed up. I'm sorry. Slavery still, slavery still exists. Slavery, slavery still. They took the shackles off our, off our ankles and put them on our minds. You know? They put a week we out here at eight in the morning with liquor bottles. Can't we mad at the liquor stores because they don't open early enough, you know? Um, shit, we're using every every damn drug that's known in the book. We look at young people today, young black Americans, and, and we as older black Americans say, why don't you understand the struggle? What happened? What blinked it all out? How could you not see? How could you not have heard? Because it is not their struggle. We have finally reached a generation that is separate, that is removed from slavery and Jim Crow. They are not a product of it. It's not a struggle. They should know. I just feel like, <clears throat> man, slavery, it just really damaged everything forever to the end of life. I feel like if anything is gonna change with the black people, with the black culture, God is basically gonna have to come back, wipe this, this whole entire earth clean, and we're just gonna have to start all over again. We, we're never gonna come out of that. It's like our mentalities, it's just like, man, it's just, it's crazy because even in my, my conversation yesterday about white women and black men, well, they were like, well, white women is this, that, and the other. Well, white women, why our ancestors was in the field getting beat, their ancestors were in buildings getting education. You know what I mean? So yes, it, it has and is gonna have a long-term effect on African Americans for the rest of our lives, forever. Dr. Ben Johannan, who just passed away not long ago, one of the great, great, scholars who said that there's an unbroken psychological chain from slavery and that psychological chain is hooked to the white man and to the black man and the white man has an unbroken psychological chain that makes him think he's superior and some black people have an unbroken psychological chain that make them think that they are victims not that they're inferior but they are victims they have a victim mentality because they have been victimized. I refuse to continue to allow black people to adopt and to um, adopt the idea that they are still affected by slavery because too many people have worked too hard for us to progressively be moving at a steady rate. We should begin skyrocketing upward and um, I, I hate that Nick, victimhood is taught in black culture, like victimhood. And I think that we need to remove that altogether and that starts with the narrative that we're still affected by slavery. The slave owners, the government, America, that's remorse. Repatriations is about remorse, I'm sorry. But they were not sorry. 
because they understood that they wanted the whites to continue to rule the economy. So they created the sharecropping system. So it wasn't just that they didn't give blacks land and freedom because they understood by not giving them the economic means to survive, they would be forced into a new system of slavery, sharecropping and tenant farming, locking them to the land for almost another hundred years. So should there be reparations? Yeah. Evils that continually trap blacks and low-paying, dead-end jobs, crumbling underdeveloped neighborhoods, struggling schools that undereducate, and opulent health care systems that don't work. This ain't about being victimized. This is about being oppressed and exploited. Yeah, like that. yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is that an indoctrination? That, that's what we've been taught. That's embedded in us. The ripple effect of what they put upon us way back when has caused I mean, that, we, we, that way honest, of thinking in our heads. Be honest, before Obama was president, did, everybody, did anybody think a man of color was going to be the president? Oh, absolutely not. I, I never thought, thought a man of color. I never I thought. thought. I grew up. I knew it was going to happen. Thinking I have the ability to be the president, right. but not knowing that I can be. Can be, right. Right. Because anybody before him was always white. Yeah. So, I mean, even transferring from slavery to now, so y'all think we still affected by slavery? We're still slaves. Yeah, we're still slaves. Steve, yeah. Corey, that was only 50 years ago, bro. No, that was Bullard. No, that was more like 75. No, that was 50 years ago, bro. Martin Luther King died in 68. Well, we wasn't slaves when Martin Luther King was around. Yes, it was. What you think he was marching for? Nah, civil rights, huh? Civil rights, right to vote, right to vote. Well, why we have to like Chapter four, structural racism and affirmative action. Well, I think affirmative action certainly existed in this country at a time when there was rampant discrimination and when uh, African Americans and other people of color were being unfairly denied opportunities and affirmative action programs were designed to level the playing field. In this day and age, many of those programs have been dismantled. So those that think there are still many programs in that 1960s, 70s affirmative action space I think they're wrong about that. I think in this day and age when people are able to break through, when people are able to succeed, it's because they've put in the work, it's because they have the talent, it's because they've accomplished what they need to accomplish to be able to be in the position that they're in. Um, I wouldn't call it preferential hiring as much as I would call it makeup for history hiring. The only reason affirmative action exists, there was always African Americans who can fulfill jobs from the eight, even from the 1600s, who can do the work, but they was discriminated against. I do believe in justice. And affirmative action is simply justice. Oh, their family is established. Here it is with black people, we have to work hard since birth, you know, like. We have came from nothing. Our parents, nine times out of 10, they're not passing any down, anything down to us. So we have to work for everything we have. If it were not for affirmative action, I might still be on the job that I'm on. But some of the other individuals that I see out there, they might not have been given that right. And I tell you something, affirmative action only means that. That if you got a skill level, you should not be eliminated. It don't mean that you give somebody something that they can't handle or that they're not worthy of. It means you can no longer keep them away from it even though they earned it and are worthy of it. That's affirmative action. If you to affirmatively seek the people who are right for this work who happen to be people of color. And the only reason there'd be any is because there was a tradition for years of keeping it from them. I teach my son that he will always have to work 10 times harder than a white man, and he has to be smarter. And I might not seem like that's the right thing to say 
to other people, but for my son, um, he has to know what he's stepping into. So when he does go to this job interview or when he does go to a certain event and he's not picked for the color of his skin, then he knows how to keep moving. There's an older white male, he's there, and um, he's talking about how, you know, he left his dog somewhere with like a dog sitter in a cage or whatever. And then someone asked me, well, who keeps your child? Because I had recently just had a baby, and he says, oh, well, why don't you just leave him in a cage? Because that's what he'll be when he gets older. Really? So are you saying that you either call my son an animal, or you're saying that he's going to be in jail? And is it because he's black? And obviously because he's here, and I'm here. I didn't say anything, because, come on, he's been with the company this many years. I've been with the company this many years, and I'm just a black woman. They're not going to do anything about it. So. I said nothing. But if you go amongst a lot of folks, they'll realize we work just as hard, if not harder. Because as my grandfather said, oftentimes you got to be twice as good in order to get half the credit. And when you work in that reality, you don't just dust it off, but you recognize, you know what? I'm here for me and mine. And I'm not going to allow myself to be distracted with other people's issues. So the whole thing with the affirmative action I always see it as a historical makeup for all our ancestors who were denied the jobs and the opportunity they was well, if not more, qualified to fulfill. That just ain't happening in America. So they designed affirmative action to create the illusion of fairness. But in this great nation, even symbolic equality was too much for white races. So for all intents and purposes, they tore down the citadel of affirmative actions or deliberately and intentionally designed to keep blacks locked in the nation's socioeconomic basement. Chapter 5, Being Black. I can talk about an experience on the campaign trail when I was first running for mayor and it seemed like the momentum was building, and I was getting more and more support, and I was getting support in every section of the city, and I was in a particular section of the city that was a mostly white section of the city where there were a lot of people at an establishment who were there to support me, and one of the people at the event said, I never voted for an N-I-G-G-E-R before, but I'm going to vote for you. And everybody around kind of froze, and they looked at me like, oh. You know, everybody was murmuring and muttering, like, what's he going to do? What, what's he going to say? And I simply said, well, thank you very much for your support. I appreciate it. And I kept moving. I always knew that we were black. And I had an obligation and a responsibility to conduct myself in a most skillful way. And that's one thing I am grateful for in being raised in a family that was conscious of not only ourselves but the society in which we operated in. My parents are from Florida. And like most in those days in the early 50s and the 60s, we would travel back home to the old country if you will, as black Americans, to see our parents and see our people. The fear for those traveling from the North who have been living in the North and raised their children in the North to travel back South was great. I remember the practice of my father and my mother as we were to travel back by car, definitely through the back roads, we had to know how to read a map back then because you weren't allowed to take the interstates. You wouldn't be served, as I said earlier. You would give out a gas and that's where you would be, still stuck to this day with your skeleton and cobwebs on the interstate. No one would help and no trucks or anything would come to your rescue. You had no business being there. You knew better. Yeah, sure that's happened. It's happened in my life. Generations prior to me taught we're taught differently, and we grow up, and it's even affected me too, where I was negative at one time in my life. 
got to overcome that and persevere through it and become the person you are, not the person the people in the past t taught you to be. We had to practice how we would behave on our trip as we would travel deep into the south, all the way into the state of Florida. How you would get out of the car, how you would use the restroom, how you would go into the store for a soda or some potato chips. We had to practice and be drilled over and over how we would behave as young children, how to enter a store, how to leave out of a store, as to not attract attention, not to put our father or our mother in jeopardy of being accused of your children destroying or stealing or touching things. You would stand at attention by your father's side, tell him what you need, stand in plain sight of the storekeeper while your father went and fetched from the counters and the shelves what you ask for. When you received it, walked strongly and sternly back to your mother at the car and send the next child into the store to stand by the father. And the same drill will be repeated for that child until all have been served, get in our car and drive off. I'm no different from anybody else, man. You know, it's just the fact that, you know, my color, the complex, the color of my skin is what makes me a minority, not my state of mind. Damn. It's challenging. It's hard. Um, it's a lot that we have to um, put up with. Um, for one, the stereotypes of black women. Um, a typical black woman that you might see on an everyday basis doesn't look like the woman that you might see on your TV screen. I started my truck, and I guess it, uh, you know, it startled them. The little girl turned around and, and looked and said, <gasps> like that. So she comes walking up. Talk to this fucking nigga not... right now. I am telling you, he's video recording me. He scared the shit out of Anthony. He started in the car. He wanted to run his mouth talking about BB and the trashy mother. Fucking say really? something to him I now. Said that. He's got me on videotape, and I'm still flipping the fuck out. You called me a nigger. Go I, ahead. I called you a nigger. You're a nigger. Nasty fucking nigger. It made me feel hurt, but her comments didn't affect me to a point with, to make me aggravated. I was more upset that she did it in front of her kids. You know, she did it in front of her kids, and now she's teaching them hate, and uh, that's what they grow up with, and that's that cycle that keeps repeating itself. Black is a multidimensional thing that starts with understanding that you gotta love your people in order to love yourself. And those who want freedom without fighting for it, as Frederick Douglass would say, are people who want the rain without thunder and lightning. Being black is being strong, dancing past racist jabs, floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee. Being black means relishing in your blackness, moving to the rhythmic beats, feeling the pain, but still managing the same. Let me show you the mind frame of this country, man. Yeah? You know, black people getting killed by white men been going on since the beginning of the time. It seemed like, you know, Kaepernick taking a knee is not just offensive to the NFL, you know what I mean? He, make, he making a stand against this country, you know what I'm saying? For the wrongs and injustice of this country, so. Well, I, I, mean, I almost feel like even when they said like the military, like you disrespecting them. I don't feel like he disrespected anything. This country tell you that you have your freedom of speech. I have a freedom, I have a choice to make. I mean, he made a choice. And that's what, you know, that's what's wrong with this country. We don't, we don't, we don't stand, we don't stand for something. I, I respect him that he stood for something. I respect him that he, that, had, that he had, took guts and, 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 and made a stand. He didn't ask anybody to get involved with it. He didn't, he didn't ask anybody to, to help him. He stood on his own merits. And, and I respect him. Chapter six, blacks and police. As Kinsey was then shot in the leg, it wasn't caught on camera, but he says he had his hands up the entire time. When he hit me, I'm like, I still got my hands in there. I said, no, I just got shot. And I'm standing in the cell, I'm like, sir, why did you shoot me? 
And his ex and his words to me, he said, I don't know. He just shot his arm off. We got pulled yeah. over on Larpener. I told him not to reach for it. I told him to get his hand off it. He had, you told him to get his ID, sir, and his driver's license. Oh my God, please don't tell me he's dead. Please don't tell me my boyfriend just went like that. Just keep your hands where they are, please. Yes, I will, sir. I'll keep my hands where they are. Go and take your seatbelt off for me. I ain't even doing nothing. Are you? Go and take your seatbelt off. Stop. Stop. For every American to enjoy the privileges of being American without regard to his race or his color. In short, every American ought to have the right to be treated as he would wish to be treated, as one would wish uh, his children to be treated. But this is not the case. The Negro baby born in America today, regardless of the section of the state in which he is born, has about one half as much chance of completing a high school as a white baby born in the same place on the same day. One third as much chance of completing college. One third as much chance of becoming a professional man. Twice as much chance of becoming unemployed. About one seventh as much chance of earning $10,000 a year. A life expectancy which is seven years shorter and the prospects of earning only half as much. Every time I come into police contact, it's, it's always a problem, of course. I'm black, you white, you know, you part of the law. I'm a black man out here, you think I'm selling drugs. Well, actually, I'm on my way to work. Probably stereotypical, though, of, as, as to why they, they scare the black people. From what they hear, from what they see, you know, they don't, they don't know you, but they automatically assume in you a certain way because of your color, you know what I'm saying, your race or your neighborhood or wherever you grew up at. Police brutality, man, it, that doesn't happen just in New York. It happens all over the world, as we see, you know. I mean, once we once we got to social media where people had cameras and everything, you know, we was able to see it other than just hear about it. For whatever reason, they choose to put their, their will upon you. In other words, beat you senseless. Uh, they all will back it up that you were the one that caused the incident. In other words, they won't snitch. That sounds like a gang to me. We all are army, you know, and out here in these streets, man, we supposed to be, instead of police doing what they out here doing, we supposed to be policing our own communities. You know, when you seeing something out here going on, some type of injustice, whatever, don't be, don't be a punk, man, intervene. Intervene, say something, that's your right to say something, you know what I mean? In the United States, the police and criminal justice system are the frontline agents of social control. So how do we stop the violence? How do we end the carceral state? Community control. Community control of the police and the establishment of neighborhood courts. That's how we stop the violence and end the carceral state. We know, we're, not, we're, not, we're not perfect, we're gonna fall. We're struggling as black people, we're struggling as fathers, we're struggling as husbands, struggling as men, you know what I mean? So my advice to the black youth is just give yourself a chance, man, you know what I'm saying? When you, when, you, when, you see, when, when, when you see what's going on, if you know you can make a move that's gonna make a difference, make it. You know what I'm saying? Chapter seven, still nigger. The word nigger is not something that is applied to black people per se. I mean, you know, back then when they created it, then maybe it was, but it is a dirty, ignorant person. And that can be either black or white or whatever. I don't like it when um, our, my own people use it you know, whether it's in rap or whatever, I think it's time that, I mean, I know it's a comfort zone, you know, okay, my, you know, I, I don't like it, I think it's time that we do away with it, because if we're saying, it's offensive to me if, <laughs> if my white counterpart called me nigger, 
it's still offensive to me to hear it from my own people. So I think it's time that we kind of erase it out of our vac vocabulary. Part of it, I hate it, but at the same time, when I realize from whence it really comes and what it really means, I don't allow it bother me. And when I found out that the word nigger come from the English word niggerly, which means not to work, not to do, not to follow through, laziness or whatever, I knew that did not apply to us as a people when I recognize our history. Racism will minimize itself because the way we have the internet and how to put people on blast and to make things viral. So when we have an incident of somebody getting called a nigger or somebody getting called a white cracker by a black person, I think racism now is more, more broadcast now more than ever. Social media has created a culture where everyone has to have the same opinions and ideas. And if you don't have the same opinion or idea as someone else, you're going to be shamed. And that is horrific. And this is one of the most important things perhaps we can understand from this conversation. In the 70s, 60s, there was a powerful word in our vocabulary, Uncle Tom. And there was also another powerful word, nigger. Uncle Tom allowed us to identify our enemies. Uncle Tom allowed us to clearly find those blacks who placed their interest above the masses, those blacks who would get ahead by walking on our backs. Uncle Tom was our light. It was where we would shine it in the darkness to find those evil betraying black people. Nigger was just a word that we kind of like used in a camaraderie way, and they used against us. Fast forward. Somebody killed Uncle Tom. No one uses the term. Nigger is alive and well. How could we lose Uncle Tom and retain nigger? That's the question that you have to ask. White people are not our biggest problems. We are our biggest problems. I feel like white people give us all the opportunity in the world to succeed, to move forward, to become successful, but we don't take advantage of those opportunities. Um, I just feel like we are our own worst enemies. And um, <clears throat> I don't feel like anything is gonna change until we as a black, as a whole, come together and take responsibilities for our actions. Other people can't stop you. Only you can stop you. There are often times when other people will call you out of your name. Other people will try to stop you from, from doing things. But if you do what you're supposed to do, if you do your homework, if you show up to work before time, if you leave work, after time, if you do what you're supposed to do at work, if you get a good education, it's a lot harder for people to stop you from succeeding. Not that there isn't discrimination, not that there isn't prejudice, not that there are those who won't treat you improperly and who won't try to deny you opportunity, but it's harder if you do the right thing, if you do the thing that you're supposed to do. I have hope in the people. There are good people in all communities. And I think if we do more communication, we meet each other face to face, we share our history, our culture, and our traditions, I really believe that we would have a much better world. And we may not in the future have as much racism as we see today. The current state of America in my view, is very polarized. It's, it's more divided than I've, than I've really ever seen it in my lifetime. Um, and it's very scary. At a time where we thought we were moving forward, it seems like we took about 10 steps backwards. I mean, we have a new president who shows, you know, that he really doesn't care about certain nationalities, which is blatant racism, and that's our president. So it's definitely here in full effect in 2017. And, I, and we hoping it get better, but it may get worse. 
But as long as we, as a people, do our part and we come together and let them know that it's more than just gang banging and, and, and making babies and selling drugs, then they need to know what we came here for as well. Black people are extremely resilient. You could, you could look at that just by looking at what we've overcome. my brothers and sisters. The black freedom movement is not just a fight against racism and hatred, but it is a war against the violence of injustice. It is a struggle against a system that continually exploits and oppresses us. So we have to be strong, fearless, educated, and politically conscious. And yes, we have to fight back. We must resist. We must. I'm Dr. Henry Lewis Taylor, Jr. And thank you for listening to The Blackness Project. History is about to be un unrevealed. You right. should be a better count. No. No. First question is come back. Let's admit, I think that I should do a better way of living. Instead of slaying and begging. Well, let that little kid make that 70 grand. But tell him, yo, listen, man, you can be a cop. Be a cool ass cop. Right, don't be no asshole. Be a cool cop. Like, how many times I don't see a little viral joints on, on social media? Why well, didn't you see some white cops? I don't know what it was. I think it was in Florida or something. My man got all his car and got the hooping with the kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love seeing that. Yo, that's, that's kind of dude. I'm, you know what I mean? Like, yo. Even the one that was playing football. Come on, man. <laughs> yo, for real. That's you know, I like to put like a lot of thought into my projects and kind of, you know, a lot of love. <laughs> <laughs> My How you feeling about the day of shooting? Yeah, I'm gonna check. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna check. Good day in the life of Black Rose. Yeah, it's like, like, if you, if you can picture um, when you were trying to, like, get your, you're trying to get into college. Right. You know what I'm saying? You get the, you get the mail right there. Uh -huh. You don't know what you, you know what I mean? If it's gonna say you're accepted, if you're denied, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> This is Swedish. Swedish? <laughs> I could be Swedish. I could be you know? Swedish. I don't know, man. It's uh, it's very much possible. Yeah. Financially, yeah. Okay. Jennifer okay. Parker. Let's, 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 let's get something going. Let's always working. Always, always working. Always working. Right, my working. producers, yeah, we gotta, we gotta go. We gotta go. Black right. parents right. is just scared. They be in competition. Black parents be in competition with other black parents about their kids and how fly they is. That's fucked up, right? I don't, I don't really deal with current events no more. You don't? Why? No. Uh, I mean, I, I live in the, I live in the hood. I don't, I don't got my own current events. I'm saying, but um, you gotta remember, slavery didn't go away. I mean, they just changed the name of it. They call it prison now. <laughs> you know, but when you come to corporate and white America, I mean, they rule. What can we What can we say? We, they rule. We lead. It's been like that for years. Your neighbor's name and y'all had a dialect. Now we don't know each other and it's like, if we don't know each other, how can we move forward? If, if there's no unity and it's so, everybody's so separate, we're gonna have the same results and that's just young black men getting killed. And that's gonna be the continued rise of statistics until we're able to do stuff like this. So.